We're here in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress 2022. I'm here with Adrian Scrace, CTO of Etsy. Adrian, great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you too, Ray. Yeah. So uh, obviously back into the meeting flow here at the, the show, talking to lots of different people. What in your mind is the single most important technical challenge that faces the telcos these days and that they need to overcome in the next five years? And what are the telcos asking you to help them with? I, if I could change the question slightly and give you two rather than one, because I, I think there are, there are two sort of challenges which um, we, we need to face. One is the emergence of non-public networks, which is rather a disruptive concept. You know, we're saying that the world won't be full of large public network operators. It will be a sea of non-public uh, networks. And learning how to actually integrate that together, I think, is, is one challenge, because it, it's not just technically, it involves a change of mindset too. And, we see good early evidence that the world is ready for this non-public network venture. And in the same vein, the non-terrestrial approach, where um, the, the, the ideal is that uh, we have a terrestrial network with non-terrestrial elements, and it's all using exactly the same technology, the same air interface. So it's a seamless uh, coverage, if you like. And you can imagine what you can do if you have uh, non-terrestrial coverage. You can increase capacity if you need to in a hurry. Uh, the regrettable instance we see uh, right now in Ukraine where maybe the terrestrial network will be severely damaged. You can then have non-terrestrial coverage and, 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 and get broadband coverage in there quickly to alleviate um, uh, the pressure points. So there's a lot of benefits both in the non-public approach, the non-terrestrial approach, and, and to me these are two of the game changers that's going to keep us busy for the, for the coming years. Okay, and so what is the telecoms community asking Etsy to do? Is, is it to find ways to make these things work together in a, in a seamless way? Yeah, it, and the seamless element is the most important part. Of course, we could do this by using different air interfaces. We've, we've been doing this for years. You know, the satellite link has always had its own bespoke radio. It's not using the same uh, sort of 5G NR that we would use on, on the ground. So the, the clever thing here is making it uh, completely seamless because then you start to have reuse, you have uh, economies of scale, um, ease of deployment, uh, if you imagine controlling um, uh, UAVs, for example, where maybe they, they move out of terrestrial coverage and they can still be um, controlled and maintained by non-terrestrial. Right. So uh, it's, it's really building that scale around a consistent approach rather than piecing together um, components and trying to make it work. So, yeah. so. And of course, Etsy and 3GPP are both good places to do that because we have such a large ecosystem of players in the room. All of the interested parties are present and we, we then provide a great venue for them to try and sort out the nitty gritty. Okay, well it sounds like a big challenge, something that can will keep you busy for, for a while along with all the other things you're doing of course. Now something that has been keeping Etsy uh, busy and also you know very much in, in the minds of the, of the industry in the past eight or nine years has been uh, NFV, Network Functions Virtualization. Um, how has that developed and evolved? Because it's like eight or nine years since that th first became you know, a term and a concept and something that the operators are embracing. Uh, because the term NFE, it's used less now, but that doesn't mean it's any less relevant. No, indeed, and I think we can learn quite a lot from the NFE journey because um, like many of these things, it's, it's large, it's disruptive, it requires a complete change of mindset. And we set ourselves very challenging targets and say we're going to do this in two or three years. And in fact, the reality is it's probably going to take 10 years. Um, but I, I, I still think it's the right thing that we did. We started maybe ahead of the wave, uh, that the idea was just starting to boil and, and Etsy was in there at the beginning and said we're going to create a, a venue for people to come together and talk about this. But maybe we were a bit optimistic in the time frame, but it doesn't matter. We created the venue, we've produced the, the output, and now as you rightly say, virtualization is sort of taken for granted. That's, it's assumed that the future networks will be fully virtualized. So, uh, so all credit really to the guys in, in ISG NFE who, who did all that groundwork, which is now the basis for our future. And that work continues it's not like the, no, the, the ISG hasn't closed down not anything, at all no it continues because there's still a lot to talk about you know maybe the the uh, the groundwork has been completed but you know when once you start to get into deployment you then have that feedback loop from the problems of deploying the standard uh, that then has to be corrected in in future versions so it, 
when the standards are finished, that's not the end of the story. It's when the deployment is finished that you can then say the standards are mature once you've taken that feedback into, into account. So virtualization, obviously that's been a, a topic for many years and right at the top of a lot of agendas and something that has now really come to the fore across the whole industry is sustainability uh, and energy efficiency in particular. Um, has that become a bigger area of focus for Etsy and do you have any particular initiatives that are focused on green networks? I mean, for Etsy, energy efficiency isn't something new. We've been working on that for, for a number of years now. Um, and the early work was really trying to set up metrics and KPIs so that if we try to reduce consumption or improve efficiency, we have a re reliable way to measure that. Uh, otherwise, you're sort of guessing about you know, how more efficient you are with the, the, the latest configuration. And that early Etsy work has then been adopted um, globally uh, and becomes the basis upon which you can then compare your network perhaps against uh, your, your competitor. But more recently the minds then are focused on not just the, the, the measurement and the KPI but you know, the, the practical elements of how can you actually improve that, that efficiency. And this is a little bit of a challenge because as we evolve our technology uh, people assume that they will get um, higher performance, lower latency, uh, better coverage, all of which then sort of tends to consume more energy if we just stick to our original sort of telecoms uh, thinking. So now it's time for the engineers to really look to see uh, what can be done practically to reduce the energy consumption within networks and there are simple things like um, reducing um, base stations or node bees, turning them off in the night, uh, reducing the, the footprint if there's no traffic, um, through to say using optical components rather than wireless components which inevitably will, will reduce the, the consumption. But I think what's important is the imperative here that you know we're seeing top-down government pressure. Uh, most nations now have programs to reduce um, carbon footprint and rightly so. Uh, we then see tier one operators publicly declaring dates by which they will become carbon neutral and the shareholders of those uh, operators are going to ex expect that to happen. So, you know, it's no longer a part of a wish list. This really becomes an imperative and, and something that we're just going to have to get on with and it, it becomes a cornerstone of any future work for us. Absolutely. And uh, it's good to see that it's not just lip service anymore. This is stuff that's actually happening and it's really driving strategic decision making and agendas Absolutely. for sure. Now obviously what you do at Etsy, you know, the, the industry is looking into you and saying help us develop this um, uh, to help with the future, but what do you want to see from the industry? What initiatives, imperatives do you want to see from the telecom industry in the next few years that could help shape what Etsy is doing and help with the work that you've got planned? I mean, we've, we've sort of moved away from delivering services to people and, and 5G was that tipping point where, you know, we really are aspiring to deliver services to industry at large. And, and that is a, a voyage of discovery for us because as telecom engineers, we don't know an awful lot about power stations nor car manufacturing plants, but we better learn pretty quick because if we're going to deliver services to those industries, you really have to understand how they're going to use them. So what, what we really need is... Um, uh, greater input from those industries and the better understanding of how they will use the technologies that, that we create. And, and you can't just say, well, come to us, because it, it doesn't work like that. You know, there's, there is a, a come to us and we come to you too. And what we're seeing is a, you know, a, a number of industry associations being created that are representative of, of that particular sector. So Etsy then tries to engage with that representative group um, and make them feel welcome in our club. Uh, and, and try to make it so they don't feel that we're trying to sell them something because it's not what we're trying to do you know we're trying to understand their needs so that we can deliver a compelling um, service to them which actually makes them more efficient more more profitable um, digitizing all industry sectors it's again it's part of this great grand scheme uh, but to do that you really have to understand how these sectors are going to use the technology absolutely yeah no that's critical to to, to every company really in this industry and it, it doesn't make sense for everybody to go and try and find it out themselves so good to have a, some central points for that, for that information delivery and the to and fro the backwards and forwards all very symbiotic now obviously we're here in Barcelona back on on mass for the first time in a, in a few years um, when you come to Barcelona what is your 
tapas go-to choice in the evening or if you anybody can get out at lunchtime what, what do you go for first on the menu and what's the drink that you would have with it I mean, on, the good thing about Barcelona is you can walk up the Ramblas, you can turn left or turn right, and you're immediately into a myriad of little streets. And every one of the tapas bars in that myriad of little streets is good. So you don't have to worry about making a reservation. You just bowl up, you go to the first one you like. And for me, it's always the hamel. You know, the, the Spanish hamel is delightful. So that's what I go, go to first. Um, knock, knock back with a nice glass of Rioja, I would say. That's proving to be a very popular combination this week, not only in our interviews, but I think in the industry in general. Adrian, great to see you again. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Ray.